Hello and welcome to Move Conversations. This is your host Venkat. This is a special bonus episode. Supply chain finance has been in the news recently. Also in the news has been the collapse of Green Seal Capital and the impact it had on other institutions. To explain these developments, we welcome back Mr. Srinath K. Seven, our specialist on trade finance and supply chain. Srinath is the chief executive of Trade Risk Consulting and a well-known trade finance consultant. He has been a trainer for Euro Money and World Bank Group for many years. Welcome back to Move Conversations Trade Stuff, Srinath. Thank you, Venkat. Good to be back. Thanks for uh, you know accepting this at a short notice. So you know, Srinath, uh, you know, especially with the collapse of uh, Green Seal Capital, uh, and some of the people you know in the financial community have been talking about supply chain finance. So to begin with, what is supply chain finance and how does it work? Good question. Some of us are still trying to figure that out. <laughs> we are not. Uh, but let me give you my take on it as usual. Um, so all businesses are operating supply chain. You've got the raw material procurement stage. Then you've got the production stage following which there could be a brief period of warehousing. Uh, and finally, uh, deliveries uh, against sales. And then you could, again, insert warehousing somewhere along the distribution end of the supply chain. So uh, when we're talking about supply chain finance, uh, we're talking about the part of the supply chain where it is uh, towards the end, uh, end of the business, where uh, the goods have been produced and uh, are to be delivered on a credit basis. Uh, to customers. That is broadly speaking the area, uh, but there are applications of what is broadly referred to as supply chain finance, even at an earlier stage of the supply chain, particularly when it comes to procurement of raw materials, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll come to that later. So, um, you know, sometimes when we talk about supply chain finance, uh, it depends what definition you abide by. Uh, now, in the industry, we have the Global Supply Chain Finance Forum, and they brought out a document in 2016, as I recall, which laid out the standard definitions. So broadly speaking, they've again gone into a little bit of detail. So pardon me for having to do that now, just so that we get all the context right. No problem. So broadly speaking, there are two categories of supply chain finance as defined by the Global Forum. One is a receivable purchase uh, category. Let's put that on one side. And the other side is loan-based uh, supply chain finance. Mm -hmm. So uh, since we're going to be talking mostly about the receivable purchase is what I presume since you mentioned uh, grain sale, mm -hmm. uh, let me first just uh, dispense with a brief explanation on the loan-based. So when we talk about loan-based supply chain finance, we're talking about uh, say loans against receivables, uh, talking about distributor finance, loans against inventory, and uh, some pre-finance as well. Okay. So that is one part, one half. The part I guess we will focus on in this conversation is the receivable purchase category of uh, supply chain finance. And that includes what is referred to uh, as supply chain finance as well. So supply chain finance can be a broad umbrella term in the manner in which I just described it. And then there is one particular item on the receivable purchase side, uh, which is actually called payables finance in, in some quarters. Uh, that is uh, supply chain finance in the definition of some of the financial institutions. Right. So at the end of the day, there's a supplier, there's a buyer. Uh, the buyer requires credit terms. The buyer is of uh, good financial standing. And so there are, financial intermediaries like banks, for example, who step in between the supplier, a small scale supplier perhaps, and a large scale buyer, and offers to pay off the supplier before the actual expiry of the credit period. So right. that is where the intervention takes place. And uh, that is in the, in, in, in the sense what we're referring to as supply chain finance. Then that leads me to the question that like, if it is not banks, you know, there are talks about funds that uh, are, you know, talking about supply chain finance. So, so th this is obviously the other intermediaries that you were talking to talking about. So how do they do anything differently from the bank? 
Well, yes, uh, there has been intervention of non-banking institutions in the supply chain finance uh, business. Right. Uh, part of the reason is, I guess, the banks left the door open uh, in terms of not occupying certain sections of the marketplace and uh, the speed with which they responded. So uh, other enterprises, non-banking financial institutions uh, and fintechs have moved in quite aggressively. Okay. Uh, since we are speaking to an audience in India, uh, the big topic in and India, Singapore. Of is, yeah, and Singapore, yeah. of course. Uh, speaking, uh, speaking about receivables finance, there is the TRED mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. uh, which has uh, uh, become very active in the Indian uh, financing space. Uh, so receivable finance as such is receiving a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, through receivables finance, uh, the financing institutions can reach a broader spectrum of the market. Uh, whereas previously, they would be focused more on the upper tier companies, companies with Correct. strong balance sheets and all that. With mm -hmm. receivables finance, uh, the posture is different. Okay. And there are reasons for that, which I can get into later. Sure. And uh, that enables financing institutions to look at financing, not just the top tier companies or the upper tier companies, but also the SMEs and the MSMEs. Mm -hmm. So therefore it has great appeal. Governments are very interested because it improves financial inclusion. Um, SMEs, as you know, are the engine for growth for almost any economy in the world. True. So that being the case, uh, the ability to uh, have credit penetration at that level is always helpful and right. so it's become a very current topic and and banks have moved into it in a very large way so talk about any major banking institution and they will have a, a portfolio called supply chain finance a distinct portfolio called supply chain finance mm -hmm. and that would be a growing segment uh, in the in the business banking space of the okay bank will occupy so a, when we are talking about these funds, uh, do they bring in other players, other parties uh, to put the whole structure together? The simplest format is on the one hand, you've got uh, suppliers mm -hmm. who, as I said, could be of varying stages. Right. Uh, and then on the other hand, you've got buyers who are generally uh, seen to be as uh, better rated companies, more mm -hmm. sizable corporations mm -hmm. with better financial mm -hmm. standing. Mm -hmm. And in between the two, you have uh, financial institutions. So uh, in the si more simple structure, uh, you really have only three parties, these three parties, the buyer, supplier, and the financial institution. Right. Financial institution intermediates between the two, between the buyer and the supplier. Right. Uh, in order to make sure that the supplier gets paid off uh, without having to wait for the entire credit period to expire. That is the commonest uh, format. Correct. Uh, in some cases, as I guess we are going to visit uh, later in this conversation, there can be a certain level of complexity okay. in terms of how the financing is actually, or the funding is provided mm -hmm. for uh, supply chain finance and uh, so when we are going to talk about receivables finance uh, mm. in particular, I'll be happy to expand on that. Okay, so so then uh, let's bring up the uh, elephant in the room, and then you know, and you could probably contextualize it, you know, with the with the big more complicated structure that they put together. Sure. So the what was in the news has been that like. Uh, uh, Greensill Capital's failure, and uh, in your opinion, so what what led it led it to, led to its uh, collapse, and uh, where does supply chain finance uh, investments in that funds uh, getting involved? How where do these all of these pieces uh, you know fit into the whole uh, ecosystem that that was created there? Oh, thank you for that question, Venkat. So Greensill, the Greensill matter is an evolving matter. So right. I'm sure there are many courtrooms that are occupied with this particular topic. So information is flowing out uh, at the rate at which uh, it is allowed to flow out. Right. So whatever I have to say, of course, is based on uh, public reports, but information is in the public domain True. and my understanding of that. True. Uh, True. So um, yes, uh, Greensill Capital, as I understand it, was a firm 
that was intermediating between uh, sellers of uh, goods and services to large buyers. And uh, the model was essentially the same, pay off the suppliers before the credit period expires. Uh, now, there were a few, shall we say, differences in okay. this green sale situation. Mm -hmm. One was the way in which uh, they funded the payments to suppliers. Okay. So yes, uh, I believe they had funds to, uh, to pay suppliers, which they had raised from investors and other sources. But in addition, uh, they had another uh, channel and that mm -hmm. was uh, gaining access to some supply chain funds. Okay. So what they were actually doing was uh, they would have Green, the green seal capital would have receivables on its books, receivables due from these large buyers. Okay. And uh, what they did was they obtained uh, credit wraps from insurers for these portfolios of receivables uh, and then packaged it into asset backed securities, which they then sold to uh, supply chain finance funds, mm -hmm. who in turn were backed by large, sophisticated investors. And you've heard the names of certain banks being involved in that whole process. Sure. Uh, so far, we've been hearing mostly of one bank, but uh, I believe there should be probably other banks involved as well, um, who might be funding under a similar structure. So uh, instead of Green still using its own funds, as in uh, you know, uh, its own funds as in customer deposits, not a you know customer deposits and uh, interbank funds. Is right. a source of all financing for banks. Right. Uh, here, Greensill had uh, limited access to its own funds. And so it right. supplemented this with this uh, arrangement where they could gain access from supply chain finance funds maintained okay. by certain banks around the world. And uh, through that, they expanded quite dramatically. Now, uh, that is the basic model as I've understood it. And, um, what has happened is one of the fun, uh, shall we say, at the very fundamental level, uh, when we're talking about receivables finance, there are at least three minimum conditions that have to be met. Right. One is that the receivable exists. Correct. Second is that the receivable is assignable. And the third right. is that the receivable is enforceable. Right. Now, while reading about the green seal story, uh, there are a few things that have emerged. One is the question, uh, when insurance was sought from the uh, credit insurers mm -hmm. over portfolios of receivables, were all the receivables from the top tier companies as it was suggested? Right. Were there, should we say, lower rated companies, receivables that were also in the mix? Right. That is one issue. Uh, the second issue is about future receivables. Right. Uh, now, uh, the concept of future receivables or financing uh, uh, in anticipation of future receivables is not an unknown idea. In fact, mm -hmm. in finance, we, we do a fair amount of financing at earlier stages of the supply chain in anticipation that a receivable will be available to right. repay the loan uh, at a later date. But I believe the context in which future receivables were uh, mentioned in the Greensill case immediately raises the question, did the receivable exist? Right. We're talking about future receivables and uh, could it have been enforceable? Now, right. if those conditions are not met, then the insurer cannot be, well, should not be covering, uh, providing a credit wrap for that. Right. And, uh, even if they did, would it be enforceable is the question. And I would think not. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> that being the case, um, this whole uh, green, skill, uh, green, green sill case, as I've understood it, is a case where at some point the insurers said, we're not going to cover mm -hmm. uh, uh, or provide these credit wraps. By the way, there's one more item that was also brought up that there was a certain concentration of risk on certain business groups, okay. uh, which uh, goes against the grain in the sense that whenever we distribution. do this type of asset-backed securities type operation, 
the starting point is that there's a diversified pool of risk. Correct, correct. But if there is skewed risk Constant. in the, and therefore concentration of risk in a, in a, in a, in a portfolio, then uh, the riskiness of the portfolio again then comes into question. So the insurers on the one hand had issues regarding the composition of the portfolio. And the second was about uh, the discovery of these future receivables, uh, right. which clearly raised the question as to what is the liability of the insurers should a future receivable uh, <laughs> not go unpaid. Uh, and then there have been further attributions to that uh, regarding uh, you know, are these real receivables? Are they expected receivables, or are they just, you know, receivables drawn up uh, as a matter of convenience? So, so from an litigated. Yeah, so, from from an investor perspective, it is if I'm buying asset backed securities, then actually is there an underlying asset at all, right? Well, we visited that uh, that uh, nightmare of I think uh, <laughs> close to about uh, twelve years ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, but know, yeah. Uh, we have short yeah. memories and. Uh, <laughs> some of the same questions have come up uh, yeah, as to exactly. what exactly is an investor buying? What type right. of asset backing is there actually there? And right. uh, what is the enforceability of the protective covers, like insurance covers and all that? So raises many, many questions. And uh, as I said, uh, we haven't heard the final word on green sill. Uh, that is yeah. one part I wanted to mention. And the second part is, uh, which is, I think is a related point. Mm -hmm is uh, about the fact that uh, with green seal, the green seal matter turning out the way it has, how might it impact the rest of the supply chain finance industry? Right. Is, there's been considerable debate about that as well. Mm -hmm. And my take on it is that, uh, first of all, supply chain finance is such a big area mm -hmm. and it's still a growing area that uh, green seal not being part part of that ecosystem, I don't believe is going to severely uh, disadvantage the sector. Uh, there are, of course, I think good questions being asked, hard questions being asked as to why certain processes were not done, why certain due diligence Hello. wasn't done. Uh, but uh, I think the industry as a whole is going to come out better uh, assuming green cell is not going to be part of it going forward uh, based on whatever we're hearing publicly as of now. So I, I believe the outlook is good and I don't believe any bank or major institution is looking to step out of supply chain finance. They're just going to tighten up their procedures and, and uh, make sure that uh, they've got, you know, cross the T's and dotted the I's, which is what anyway every financial institution is expected to do. That's that's good to hear because all of us in uh, you know in international trade and uh, you know supply chain related businesses definitely know that like this is an uh, you know absolutely an important uh, aspect of the whole business that there has to be a supply chain finance so conceptually that cannot uh, you know and should not be sort of like uh, uh, smeared by you know one uh, bad incident but definitely as you said uh, there should be. Um, appropriate checks and balance uh, um, so that uh, all parties know exactly what what they are getting into, what they are paying for, what they are insuring, what they are securing, and so on and so forth. And uh, also in the broader interest of the uh, you know financial services ecosystem, right? Um, so I think that's a quite a positive note to 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 you know uh, bring this uh, discussion to an end. And I think it's been a uh, wonderful to understand the nuances of it and uh, you know uh, how certain risky elements can can you know uh, come into the picture so so thank you very much uh, Srinath. are there any okay. closing thoughts that you would like to add or we have uh, covered it? yes in fact there are a few things that i'd like to also bring up there's a bit of uh, shall we say controversy surrounding the way in which uh, accounting is done Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the books of the buyers. Uh, currently, accounting conventions uh, suggest that it is possible to classify the obligations due to the uh, supply chain finance provider as trade payable uh, and not as debt. So this classification could lead to some, shall we say, I don't know whether you would say deception is too strong a word, but uh, sort of a misclassification is occurring because 
it in a way sort of uh, camouflages what is the true uh, financial debt right. by a buyer company to its creditors, uh, financial creditors. And so could the ratios be actually revealing uh, a status that is uh, different from what it actually is. Right. Uh, so there is considerable discussion in the accounting circles, uh, even in the asset liability management circles, right. about uh, how supply chain finance exposures or liabilities need to be reflected on the buyer's balance sheet. Because at the end of the day, they do owe the money to the supply chain finance uh, provider. Correct. Uh, so that is something that uh, is also a matter of some concern, but I guess it'll it'll be figured out in due course. Right. Ultimately. So that's that's where I'd like to uh, sort of conclude in terms of the outstanding thoughts that I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. That helps. That clarifies uh, even more. Yeah. Thank you so much, Srinath. So You're we'll, welcome. yeah. Thank you for joining us in yet another episode of Move Conversations. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to the Move Conversations YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications of new episodes. Thank you very much. Till I see you in the next episode. Thank you very much. Have a great day.